Oh, okay, perfect. So uh, good afternoon to all of you. It has been interesting to hear that uh, you have uh, snow over there. We're having something like 27 degrees here. So our Christmas is kind of like in, um, you know, in Bermudas and t-shirts. Yeah. Um, well, that's Boston. That's Boston with snow, not the UK. UK is just white. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, so I'm uh, Fernando Gott. I'm from Argentina and I will be um, giving a short talk about um, a recent uh, Windows ICMP version 6 based uh, vulnerability. Uh, before getting into the talk, I'd like to uh, thank Veronica and team um, for organizing this event and giving me the, the opportunity to, to share um, this material with you. So, um, what is this presentation about? Uh, I will be discussing uh, a vulnerability that uh, is based on ICMP um, version 6 uh, that has been found in Windows 10. Uh, I will try to get a little bit into the details of this uh, vulnerability. And then after that, I will try to provide a very um, simple analysis of, of uh, what went wrong, like uh, whether this vulnerability could have been prevented or, or not. Um, okay. So before getting into uh, the, the vulnerability itself, I'd like to uh, briefly discuss um, a few topics that essentially provide a context for, for the actual uh, vulnerability. So let's start with um, IPv6 uh, automatic configuration, a little bit of background about IPv6 automatic configuration. So we all know that uh, IPv6 has uh, two different mechanisms for automatic configuration. Uh, one is Slack, the other one is uh, DHCP version 6. Um, Slack is, as we all know, mandatory. It's specified in RFC 4862. It's supposed to be lightweight. And the idea is that uh, if you need uh, like simple network configuration, uh, Slack should be able to provide for all that basic network configuration. And uh, one aspect of uh, Slack that is not so popular, uh, for example, in the enterprise um, environment is that it's kind of like um, uh, the anarchy for uh, automatic configuration in the sense that essentially every host that does what it pleases to some extent or another. Uh, what about the other one? Uh, so we have the ACP version six, which is optional. Uh, uh, the ACP version 6 is rather heavyweight. Um, even if you look at the spec, you can tell that it's much more complex than, than Slack. Um, the basic idea behind uh, the ACP version 6 is that it provides centralized configuration. Uh, so essentially you can uh, decide in a single place what's the configuration that every single system will use on your network. And this, this tends to be attractive for uh, the enterprise environments. And um, the HCP version six essentially is meant for, uh, let's say more advanced configuration environments. So uh, essentially the HCP version six provide all the possible configuration nodes that you could possibly think of. So that's the kind of like the basic idea of uh, what, what are the you know, differences uh, between Slack and the HCP version six, and uh, what each of these two protocols is, is meant for. Now, um, even when you might think of these two protocols are as being alternative protocols that you might use one or the other, well, that's not really the case. Uh, why is because for at least quite a long time, um, no one of these two protocols could provide all the information, all the configuration information that you need in even the most basic network scenarios. For example, uh, the HCP, uh, the HCP version six uh, can, cannot provide, that's the case even nowadays, it cannot provide uh, the address of a default router uh, so you could you can configure everything with the ACP version six, but you cannot provide host with the uh, host with the address of a default router. On the other hand, for a lot of years, uh, Slack couldn't provide the address of a recursive DNS server. So that means that uh, 
with Slack, you could provide, for example, you could uh, provide information for configuring addresses. You could provide information, uh, you could provide the addresses of a default router, uh, but you couldn't provide the uh, IPv6 addresses of a default, uh, of, of a uh, recursive DNS server. So the outcome of this is that for many years, these, uh, these two protocols were not really alternative protocols. Um, of course, um, uh, this made uh, IPv6 deployment tricky in many scenarios because, um, for example, if you wanted to uh, be able to provide uh, information about DNS servers, uh, then in most cases you had to deploy DHCP version 6 along with um, Slack. And in other cases, if you didn't want to uh, deploy the HTTP version 6, um, ironically enough, you had IPv6 deployments that were relying on the recursive DNS server information being provided uh, via the HTTP version 4. And uh, you, it, you had these uh, deployments where the only um, DNS transport that you could employ was IPv4. So you could you could do uh, IPv6 for everything else, but not for DNS. Um, so uh, we all know that the, the, let's say the first versions of the, um, of the IPv6 protocols were, uh, were published in the early 90s. And it was only in 2007 that there was uh, something published on the Slack side to uh, allow Slack to provide information about uh, recursive DNS servers. Um, so in 2007, there was RFC 5006, which was published on the experimental track uh, that was specifying the RDNS uh, option that could essentially specify IPv6 addresses of recursive DNS servers. Uh, a few years after uh, that, in uh, November 2010, uh, RFC 6106 was published, uh, which was uh, which was using essentially uh, RFC 5006 as a basis. And uh, among other things, what changed is that the track was moved from experimental to proposed standard. And uh, later on, like almost 10 years later. RFC 8106 was published, again, as proposed standard, uh, addressing some issues that had been found in RFC 6106, okay? Now, um, you know, having had something published to allow Slack uh, to uh, convey information for recursive DNS servers, you might have expected that, okay, well, everyone would support the RDNS um, option, okay? Uh, but that wasn't quite actually the case. Why? Well, because for years there has been what you might call protocol wars uh, when it comes to Slack and the HCP version 6. Uh, those wars, if you wish, um, have happened both at the specification and at the implementation level. Uh, when it comes uh, to the specification level, for example, um, well, the, uh, the relevant working groups and the ITF uh, has so far rejected the idea of standardizing uh, a DHCP, uh, of standardizing an option for DHCP version 6, such that uh, DHCP version 6 could provide um, the address of a default router. So still nowadays, even when there have been proposals for that, we still don't have an option to provide the address of a default router in the ACP version 6. Um, now, when it comes to implementations, uh, Microsoft Windows for many, many years uh, ha have not uh, included support for the RDNSS option, um, even after you know, that option uh, had been standardized. On the other hand, Android, and that's the case still nowadays, it does not support the ACP version 6. So at some point in time, what if Windows wouldn't support the RDNS uh, S option. So um, if you wanted to, um, you know, provide uh, the addresses of recursive DNS servers, uh, and you wanted to be able to uh, provide that information uh, to Windows systems, at some point in time, the only options that you had was to 
um, deployed a stateless DHCP version 6, or you had to rely on uh, this information being provided uh, via DHCP version 4. But in that case, you would only have IPv4 addresses for, uh, for um, DNS servers. Now, Android still nowadays does not support DHCP version 6. So, Fernando, I'm just going to jump in just to be, yeah, okay, you've got the date since creators yeah. update. Good, you know, because okay. people are good. <laughs> yeah, so this uh, fortunately changed. Um, so, eventually, in 2017, uh, Windows 10 creators update incorporated support for the RDNS uh, server option. Just to be clear, I don't blame, in a way, Microsoft for not having supported the RDNS uh, server option. Uh, just when it comes to my personal point of view, I think that all the parties uh, should have supported everything. And I understand that, you know, when one party neglected uh, to support one protocol, the other, you know, party neglected to support the other protocol. So that's the situation uh, that we had for quite a long time. So in, two, in 2017, uh, Microsoft uh, added support for uh, this option. Um, I don't think there's like a, a, an official reason for that, but rumor has it that there is a, a, a big um, US-based ISP, which is a big proponent of uh, IPv6, that essentially you know, talked to Microsoft and uh, they said, well, you must support this option or otherwise, uh, we might think it twice, uh, you know, before, you know, continuing supporting Windows. And a rumor has it that that's at least one of the reasons for which this support was added. In any case, uh, the good news is that in 2017, uh, we finally got some mechanism to actually be able to convey information about uh, recursive DNS servers to all operating systems. Um, yeah, shame on Android, they still do not support, you know, DHCP version 6, truth be told. Now, what's the reason for all these background uh, and, and, and why does, you know, all these uh, affect us? Well, because when you think about it, the RDNS, uh, the support for the, or, or the code for, uh, that supports the recursive DNS server option is uh, quite recent and clearly not well tested. So support was incorporated in, uh, in 2017. And uh, truth be told, it wasn't just uh, uh, Microsoft Windows that didn't support this option. Even when it comes to many other operating systems, uh, if you wanted to essentially support this option, in many cases, you had to manually add an extra package to add support you know, for this option, which in practice means that it wasn't supported either. Now, um, so yeah, the code is recent and, uh, and clearly not well tested. Um, but, you know, that's underst uh, understandable. That, that happens essentially for, you know, all code. Uh, now, if you wonder whether at this point, uh, you know, we have, you know, finished and we have solved everything that uh, we should have solved with automatic configuration. Uh, not really. I personally think that, you know, automatic configuration is still a bit of a mess, but well, that's not the topic for this presentation. Uh, if you want me to elaborate on this, uh, that, you know, you, you might um, ask further questions on the Q and A's um, section. So let's now move to the, the actual topic of this presentation, which is uh, Windows TCP IP remote code execution uh, vulnerability, which is, as I said, based on the RDNS uh, server option. So let's get into um, a few more details when it comes to this option. On this slide, you can see the syntax of this option. Uh, there are a few things to note uh, from this slide. Um, First of all, you have a, um, a length field in this option, which expresses the length of this option in units of eight bytes, okay? Now, if you look at the type length, reserve, and lifetime, that accounts for eight bytes. So the minimum size of this option is always going to be at least one. 
okay, which will account for the, let's say, mandatory uh, fields in this option. Now, um, there's a variable length uh, field that in this slide is represented as addresses of IPv6 recursive DNS servers, which uh, contains a variable number of uh, IPv6 addresses for DNS servers. Now, you might wonder uh, how could uh, a host processing this option possibly know uh, how many addresses are included in this option? Well, that's simple. Um, since we know that every option uh, will be of at least um, uh, you know, eight bytes, and we also know that every IPv6 address accounts for 16 bytes, then you can essentially um, come up with a number of options with a number of uh, IPv6 addresses in this option by doing this math, okay? Length minus one and divide that by two. Remember that the length is expressed in units of eight bytes and it also includes the mandatory fields that you have here, type, length, reserve, and lifetime, okay? So the idea is that if you want to um, essentially tell how many addresses are included in this option, just do this math and you will get the number, okay? Um, a few more things, uh, and these boils down to what I have in bold fonts in the middle of, of, of this slide. If you look at the specification for the RDNSS option in section uh, 531, it has a very simple and straightforward um, uh, validation check that should be enforced on RDNSS options. And essentially it says that if you do um, length min minus one, and if you do the modulo by two, um, then the result of that should be zero. That means, in, uh, that means essentially that if you, if you divide, um, uh, that the length field should essentially um, not be an even number, okay? That, that's, of course, straightforward because, you know, the length of IPv6 addresses is always going to be an even number, okay? Um, and in addition to that, you have to add the length of the uh, mandatory fields in the option, okay? So that's kind of like the background for, or, or the details for the recursive uh, DNS uh, server option that we need to uh, understand and know uh, to understand this vulnerability. So what happened earlier this year? Well, in October 13, Microsoft, Microsoft published uh, the details for the, this vulnerability, CBA 2020-16898, okay? Uh, there were not many details out of uh, that vulnerability in the advisory itself, but, you know, following the publication of the advisory, uh, there were a few blog posts in which, uh, you know, the authors of the blog post were essentially providing some details about the vulnerability, claiming that they knew uh, what the vulnerability was about, claiming that they have an exploit for, for the vulnerability, but noting that they, uh, that they were not able to share further details, okay? Um, and of course, many of us, you know, uh, when the advisory was published, uh, you know, tried to figure out, um, you know, what the vulnerability was all about. So some of us try the obvious stuff, like you could say, okay, well, um, we can guess that the RD RDNS -S option uh, could span, uh, past the end of the packet, for example. And we tried all those, uh, let's say, obvious um, combinations and uh, we fail, actually, miserably, you could say. Um, so uh, we tried to hit windows with, you know, the packets that we thought um, might be the ones uh, that would be affecting windows and we failed. And there were two guys, um, I don't know if they, you know, published their analysis at exactly the same time, but they did uh, publish their analysis on, on the same day. One was uh, Francisco Falcon from Quark's Lab, and the other one was Adam Sabroki from NVIDIA. 
uh, which um, who provided very ex like pr from my perspective an excellent and uh, independent uh, analysis of this vulnerability. So uh, they essentially uh, reverse engineer uh, you know the flaw, uh, you know with different strategies, and at least one of them, Adam, uh, even provided um, a proof of concept for this vulnerability. Um, so, uh, how or what is this vulnerability about in a nutshell? Uh, we will see later that there are more details involved. I will not go through all of them uh, because you need to spend quite some time, you know, going through them to understand what's going on. But um, I will essentially, you know, mention, you know, or, or discuss the high order bit of, you know, what the vulnerability is about. So let's go back to the syntax of the uh, recursive DNS server option. And this is what I have in this slide. So I have mentioned that we have the, uh, the type, the length, reserve field, and the lifetime. I already mentioned that the length value, um, uh, that the length value is, um, uh, that expresses the, uh, the length of the option in units of, of uh, eight bytes. And um, essentially, uh, the, what the attack is about is that on one hand, uh, so you will set uh, you will set the length field of the option uh, to uh, an odd number, not to an even number as was required, but actually to an odd number. And what will happen in that case is that. There were two things that will go on. First of all, uh, when Windows, uh, you know, processes the uh, processes the option and tries to learn, uh, you know, the addresses of recursive DNS server, obviously, as was discussed before, it will essentially, you know, uh, identify the number of addresses by doing this math of, you know, doing length minus one and then dividing the result by two. Okay. Now, uh, so that's okay, you could say, and that's, that's, that's perfectly well. Now, the thing that is not so good, and actually it's not okay at all, is that when processing the addresses of the uh, recursive DNS servers, uh, and going through each of the addresses, eventually, when Windows decides that, okay, I have, you know, finish processing this up this uh, recursive DNS server option and I need to skip this option uh, to get to the next neighbor discovery option instead of actually looking at the leg field of the option which is what they should do they actually only skip the number of bytes corresponding to the number of addresses that are in this field addresses of IPv6 recursive DNS servers okay so this means that if you had an odd number in the length field, okay, and you had, for example, one option here, what, sorry, one, one full address here, and then, for example, eight bytes, so you had an odd number for the length, then Windows would essentially consider that what's in the middle of this field is the next uh, neighbor discovery option, okay? Uh, now, there are a few unfortunate things here. The first one is that, you know, when Windows uh, validates uh, the syntax of, uh, of um, an, a router advertisement packets, it does the, you know, the appropriate validation based on the length. So, for example, when it comes to the recursive DNS server option, it checks the length field, okay? And for example, it, it checks that the length or, or that the, the size of the option doesn't uh, span past, for example, the end of the packet. Now, the problem is that that's the, let's say, uh, um, a, a, a validation check that they do, but then when they actually process the option, they um, essentially, as I said before, they jump to the middle of this field and consider that the next neighbor discovery option is in the middle of this field. So um, essentially the vulnerability is based on setting the length field to an uh, odd number uh, and then cr crafting, 
uh, especially crafting what goes inside this field uh, to pretend that um, you have a different neighbor discovery option encoded here. Um, some comments before we look uh, into some details associated um, uh, with the attack packets. First of all, uh, lots of the details associated with the packets that you have to, that you have to send um, are closely related with uh, some internal validation checks that Windows 10 does. So when you look at the attack packets, if, uh, if you didn't know the details of you know, uh, how Windows processes these packets in different parts of the code, uh, you might wonder, well, what's all these, you know, uh, what's all these uh, fuse about? Why, why is the attack, why are the attack packets so complex? And the reason for which they are so complex is because in order to essentially, uh, let's say, circumvent some of the checks that Windows 10 does, you uh, have to come up with packets that are um, slightly more complex than they should be. Um, so some of the things that you should keep in mind, okay, um, the source address of the ADAC packets should be link local. Um, the other thing is that the ADAC packets, when you look, uh, when you analyze the packet, you know, uh, based on the uh, type of the options and the size of the options, okay, no, we're not talking about the contents, but actually the size of the packets and the size of the um, neighbor discovery options, the packets should look like valid packets. Okay, that's very important. All the things, uh, the size of uh, the option, the RDNS uh, option should be uh, an even number. Okay, so we mentioned before that, um, you know, if you look at the size of an IPv6 address, it's always going to be uh, an even number if you if you um, express the size of a, the size of an IPv6 address in units of eight bytes, because you know an IPv6 address is 16 uh, bytes long. That means uh, it has a length of two if you measure it in units of eight bytes. And when you add to that that there's a mandatory uh, eight bytes uh, for the let's say header of of the option, then um, if the option was legal, it would have an odd number, an odd number. But in the case of the attack, the RDNS uh, server option is going to have an even length, okay? Um, now, another thing that uh, we will kind of like see in the next couple of, uh, in, in the next slide, when, you, when we look at the contents of, of, of the actual, actual attack packet, is that um, essentially we use um, uh, the way in which Windows process an RDNS uh, server option to essentially smuggle a malform option, a malform uh, road information option within the RDNS server option. So that essentially means that we use the RDNS option to essentially smuggle another option, which is the one that uh, will do the buffer overflow, okay? And the final one is that in order to um, circumvent some of the checks that Windows performs internally, you need to fragment the packet. So from a conceptual point of view, um, you could say, well, that there's not really a need to fragment uh, the, the packet because the, the problems with uh, the problem with this vulnerability is not related to uh, how the packets are reassembled. But the thing is that by using fragmentation, you're able to circumvent some of the checks that Windows was doing, some of the sanity checks that Windows was doing internally. So that's the whole point why um, the attack packets use fragmentation. So let's look very briefly at um, what, um, uh, what an attack packet looks like. Okay, so if we look at uh, the attack packet, so we can see here the output of, uh, of Wireshark, okay? So we see that we have a recursive DNS server option, okay? 
we know that, um, so the, the, the output says that uh, the length of the option is eight bytes, okay? We knew from the spec that the option all, should always be an odd number, not an even number. So um, if Windows was behaving or was complying with the RFC, this packet should have been discarded, okay? But it wasn't following the, the recommendations in, in the specification, so it actually processed uh, the packet and the option itself as valid. So the interesting thing to see here is that it claims that the option length is eight bytes, okay? So we have a group of, uh, sorry, it claims that the option length is eight, and since the option length is specified in units of eight bytes, that accounts for you know a total length of sixty-four bytes. Now, when you add, uh, when you look at um, each of the um, um, uh, at, uh, at the at the length of, of uh, each of the options, okay, we see here that in theory we have you know four IPv6 addresses. But in practice, you know, if you look at the length, what we have is the header or the mandatory fields for the option, you could say, that's eight bytes. Then we have three full IPv6 addresses, these three here, okay? That accounts for, these three account for um, uh, uh, 48 bytes, okay? And then for the last option that you see here that Wireshark prints as a full IPv6 address, we only have the, we only really have the initial eight bytes. So what we have is an RDNS server option that has a length of eight bytes. So obviously the length uh, is invalid and, and the packet should have been discarded. But it is not because you know a window wasn't following the, the the standard, and when you look at you know the payload of the uh, recursive DNS server option, you have three full IPv6 addresses, and the remaining eight bytes obviously will not will not account for a com for, for a complete IPv6 address. So what Windows will do is when processing this option, it will learn the address of these first three recursive DNS servers, okay? And based on the math that, you know, we showed before, it will say, okay, I only have three IPv6 addresses for recursive DNS servers. Now, when um, essentially trying to uh, skip this recursive DNS server option to process the next option, instead of jumping 64 bytes, it will jump the mandatory bytes for the option and the 48 bytes for the three IPv6 uh, uh, addresses that it learned. So Windows will es 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 essentially land over here. So it will process these bytes that we have here as essentially the code of the next um, neighbor discovery option. Now, if you look for 18 in hexadecimal, that's the code for um, a route information option. And if you look at the syntax of the route information option, the next byte, which is the one that you have here, A0 in hexadecimal, that essentially will represent the length of the option. So again, what we have, Windows starts processing the recursive DNS server option it finds that the length is eight or you know, uh, 64 bytes. It learns these first three addresses. And then when trying to jump to the next neighbor discovery option, instead of jumping 64 bytes, it just jumps the three options that it published, that, that it uh, learned. So it lands over here, okay? Now this road information option that's here has not been validated by Windows before, because before doing the processing of any option, uh, Windows does the validation, okay? Now the packets without, you know, this detail, the packet has already passed the validation. So Windows will not actually do a validation on 
this uh, this road information of, uh, option that has been smuggled inside the RDNS uh, server option. So this option here can now span past the end of the packet. Okay, and that's essentially where you know the vulnerability lies. Now. Uh, the packet, uh, the, the other packet is um, slightly more complex because, as I said before, in order to bypass or, or circumvent some of uh, the validation checks that Windows does, you need to actually fragment this packet. So if you look at the output from um, the proof of concept that was uh, published by Adam, uh, you will see that uh, when you run the, you know, the proof of, of concept tool, you will see all of these packets, okay? And this essentially means that the attack packet that uh, we were discussing before is sent as uh, essentially multiple IP6 fragments. So the routed advertisement message, uh, you know, follows the logic that I explained before in terms of of the structure and and what uh, and what the structure needs to be in order to uh, perform the attack, but it is actually sent as multiple fragments in order to bypass some of the checks that Windows performs internally. Okay. Um, now, uh, once you get to send this packet, you essentially get a blue screen of death in Windows. Um, I was going to, you know, run the the, the exploit, uh, you know, live during the presentation, but, you know, uh, that of, you know, getting to the blue screen of death and then rebooting happened so quickly that, you know, there was no point in doing it. But in the references of uh, of this presentation, I will provide links to the proof of concept, so you can essentially, um, you know, run the proof of concept and, and try the, the tool if uh, if you want to. So that uh, that's all about the, uh, the, you know, that's the high order beat of, of the vulnerability. Now, um, or what I was wondering myself is that, okay, what, what did go wrong? I mean, um, what things went wrong in the uh, Windows implementation of the RDNS um, server option in order, you know, for, for this uh, vulnerability to, to, to actually exist. So I found, I found two things. Uh, first one is that uh, Windows failed to validate router advertisements and uh, router advertisements in general and uh, the record CDNS server option in particular as recommended by uh, the protocol specifications. Now, um, from my perspective, that's um, important and, and interesting because quite a lot of times you have protocol specifications that you know fail to recommend uh, you know validity checks that implementations should perform. But but that's not the case in in uh, for this vulnerability. So the two um, associated specifications. Uh, provided all the recommendations that were needed to kind of like thwart, uh, you know, the um, the this vulnerability or, or the exploitation of this vulnerability. Uh, specifically, if you look at um, you know RFC sixty nine eighty, which um, I co-authored, uh, in section five it says that uh, costs must ignore router advertisements that employ fragmentation. Now. As I mentioned before, in order to bypass some of the checks uh, that Windows performs on router advertisements, you need to fragment your packets. Now, if Windows was implemented uh, RFC uh, 6980, then it would have dropped, uh, it would have discarded router advertisement uh, messages, and then, of course, uh, the vulnerab vulnerability would have been mitigated. So that's uh, the first uh, validity check that could have uh, prevented the vulnerability. The second one is a very um, straightforward and specific check that you have in RFC 8106, that is the specification for the recursive uh, DNS server option. And the spec says that 
you should check the length of the RDNS server option and it should be, the length should be an even, uh, the, the modulo should be an even number, okay? Uh, to put it in a different way, the actual length of the option should be a node value. Now, if the uh, length of the, of the option wasn't a node value, you should consider that the option is invalid and you should discard the packet. So these are the two um, uh, validity checks that, uh, that fail and that essentially um, enable uh, this uh, or, uh, or cause or this uh, vulnerability to, to exist. Um, so that's so far for the presentation. Are there any questions? Thank you very much, Fernando. So guys, the, um, it, this is open now for your questions. There is nothing on the chat right now. So Fernando, how do you think an attacker would discover that? Is that just by brute forcing lots of different approaches and as we heard earlier today, sort of throwing random stuff? to see what happens? Or do you think there was some suspicion that it might behave that way? Uh, at least one of the authors of these uh, two references, um, I think was Adam, he used a fuser and that's how he found what, uh, what was the options that would actually work. And uh, when it comes to the other author, um, if I remember correctly, I don't remember if um, he had, um, uh, a reverse engineer the patch from Microsoft, or at least had a like um, let's say a non-working exploit, and essentially use a debugger to actually you know uh, uh, you know uh, how to say it, like um, troubleshoot his own uh, attack tool and uh, eventually get to the right packet that would exploit it. Yes, yeah, so I might add here. Sorry, Anna. Uh, hi, uh, you know, talking from Apple. Um, I might add here that uh, Francisco has a long history of reverse engineering, and he recently found a very similar bug in FreeBSD, and that one uh, he found uh, well uh, by looking at the source code. But it has it's pretty much the same the same bug uh, as in Windows. Yeah, I checked. Um, I I I I don't know if we are referring to the same one, but. Um... Uh, not a long time after this vulnerability was disclosed, there was another one that was uh, disclosed for the RT sold um, daemon in FreeBSD, which is essentially exactly. the, That's the, one. the host side implementation of uh, FreeBSD. And if I remember correctly, um, the vulnerability in FreeBSD was even worse because it was actually a failure to process the length field of uh, neighbor discovery options in general, not just yes. for, for RDNS uh, server in particular. That's correct. Uh, I have a question. I'm not sure if uh, Colin and Jan from Athlon Institute are still uh, here. Uh, is any of you still present? Uh, I'm interested, if I may ask, uh, how are you handling route advertisements um, uh, in the Wi-Fi? Uh, do you drop them uh, by default, or is that an option on the on the controllers or on the um, on the IP level? Yeah, so um, on the on the controllers, we have a GRE tunnel all the way back to the controllers, and there's role-based firewalling that happens um, for each user. Um, so it's at that point we can kind of drop any any of those or a, that's not going to be there. Uh, do you have in your rules uh, something like a, 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 um, a default role, rule that um, will drop uh, packets on undetermined um, transport? Because, you know, one of the typical uh, ways to evade um, root advertisement guard, which is, you know, the, the, the typical mitigation for RA-based attacks, is that if you um, employ extension headers, even worse, if you employ fragmentation, um, you know, packets might go through the, you know, the, the device. Okay. That... Uh, that I do not know. I will have to check that one, to be honest. Okay. Yeah, I can... Um... 
uh, at here that, uh, for example, on older uh, in Cisco environments based on ROS, um, RA guard was a was a feature both on the AP and the, and the WLC level, which had uh, different default settings. And now that they move to the 9800 uh, platform, uh, you'll have to enable it uh, um, on the uh, um, uh, SYE level. So the, the configuration approach has changed. And uh, I think it, it's, it's a good idea in, the, in Wi-Fi uh, if by default uh, router advertisements are dropped, there is never a reason why you would accept router advertisements um, over the air. Well, I cannot think of many reasons, put it like this. Yeah, I would say every, every enterprise, uh, they deploy IPv6, that's where they deployed. Or at least the ones I know about. Okay, excellent. Any questions, any questions for Fernando? Now you can see his contact details there on the slide. Thank you very much, Fernando. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Good to see you, even though it's virtually. <laughs>